deal with it when sometimes we find out that we don't. Um, death, it, it brings on a sting and it brings on sadness, but um, there's so many ways we can, we, we can deal with that and we can handle that. But before we get into that even more, what I would like to do is just dig into Mr. McLeod's profession as a mortician. Mr. McLeod, tell us a little bit about yourself, first of all. Well, first and foremost, um, I am a North Carolinian. I'm a Moore County native, born and raised in the Moore County area, down in the Southern Pines, Pinehurst area. Um, 21-year retired Marine Corps veteran, um, did 21 years in the Marine Corps, and then after retiring out the Marine Corps, went off and worked at the federal prison for about five years. Um, sickness caused me to step away from that because I was hit in 2019 with um, brain surgery, a sedura wow. hematoma. Um, wow. And I touched death in probably one of the closest ways I ever thought I would touch it at 43 years old. And then I got deeper into my profession um, as an owner and operator of my own personal um, funeral home that myself and my wife now own in the Sanford area. Okay, so what, okay, so am I hearing it correctly? Because your own brush with death, you decided to get into this business? Well, I actually have been in this business probably for about 19 years. I trained and mentored up under um, Orby Simon of Simon Funeral Home down in the Southern Pines area. Um, he took me up on his wings years ago and then after working with Mr. Simon for about 15 years, I stepped out on my own. And the last four years, um, I've been in ownership of my own funeral home. Okay. Well, I want to say congratulations to you for being your own business owner. Okay. So um, now we know with what you do comes embalming. Tell us a little bit about that process. Um, the embalming process one, I always say that it's a very um, tedious process because there are different um, types of situations that bring on different types of embalming. But most importantly is to make sure that the preparation of that loved one is done in a um, proper way to make sure that the person that is doing the job is licensed by the state um, that they do follow the protocols that the state has required that we operate up under. You don't want to have someone that is not licensed doing a job that they're not um, regulated to do because then you set yourself up for failure, you set your funeral home up for failure, and you set that family up for failure because you want to make sure that one, they have the education, two, they have the qualifications, and three, they have the love and desire to be able to take care of that loved one properly. Tell us about the education part of it. How much training do you need and what? Uh, the education what, part, mm -hmm. um, if someone wants to be a what we call funeral service licensee, that means a full licensed mortician here in the state of North Carolina, they will have to attend a credited school. That means um, Fayetteville Technical Community College has a funeral service licensee program. I myself went to school, I started at Fayetteville Tech mm -hmm. and left Fayetteville Tech and ended up finishing at Commonwealth Institute of Funeral Service in Houston, Texas. Um, that's a two year program. Once they have um, finished all the credentials and qualifications there, then they'll go take what we call a national um, exam. Mm -hmm. The national exam is conducted by the um, International um, Council of Funeral Service. So once you get into making sure you take your national exam, passing, i.e., the um, national arts and the national science part. Then you'll take your funeral service, um, North Carolina licensee rules and laws and regulations. Once you pass that, then you are set up to become a licensed funeral director here in the state of North Carolina. But it's not an easy process. It mm -hmm. does take a lot of studying. Um, I tell anybody that I've had my, my time was spending <laughs> a lot of time with that national exam and seeing it eye to eye. I've seen some failures come across it before it became a success. So it does require a lot of work. And plus, you have some that just want to become a funeral director. And that means that that person has done all the necessary process and necessary steps. 
and they're in a one-year diploma program. I myself am a director, but my health caused me to step back from the embalming portion to just become a licensed funeral director. So I have the education of an embalmer, but I have the work of a director. Okay. All right. Now, how do people interact when you tell them about your line of work? Um, <laughs> it's kind of funny because a lot of times you'll have people that will ask all types of different questions. They'll start to tell jokes about it and everything. And mm-hmm. then you have to catch yourself because one funeral service is a um, respectable type of occupation. And I don't want losing a loved one to ever feel like it's a joke because it's never a joke. Like I always tell people, and I have to go back to something you said um, early with um, losing a loved one. The, the good book in the Bible tells us that life and death always lies within those that, that were promised. We're promised life and death. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, and I have to say this. Some people say, well, I lost my baby before. But what we fail to realize is that baby was living within us. Mm -hmm. So when the baby's living within us, God is still promising us that life that he promised us, whether we see it with our natural eyes or whether we feel it as a as a mother that's carrying that baby for those nine months, three months, however long God allows that baby to be carried. That's still a promise of life. And then when death does come, because all of us are going to be promised death, we're all going to touch that that door of death then we have to make sure that we're prepared for death. And that's the one biggest thing that we, as a society, uh, we fail to do is prepare ourselves for death. Right. And that's why uh, I felt like this show was needed, even though I was struggling with, do I want to talk about this today? I'm like, yeah, we're going to talk about it. You're absolutely right, sir. Um, now, you're married with children, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. Was your wife, and, and I want to give a shout-out to her and a house of applause. She was coming here today, uh, but she could not make it. And uh, uh, that's fine. We'll probably try to get her on at another time. But I'm curious to know, was she already involved in it or had the same ideas uh, for you as you to become in uh, funeral directors and, and such prior to marriage or after marriage? Um, <laughs> as crazy as it may be, myself and my wife met while we were in school. So okay. she had the idea of working, but she actually wanted to be a pathologist. She oh, wanted okay. to go into forensic pathology mm-hmm. and work in um, some type of lab and um, not work in the actual funeral profession. Mm-hmm. But as time started progressing, she made her way to working in the funeral profession. Um, I kind of, I guess, pushed the, the, the plateau of us getting into ownership and things of that nature as far as funeral home because that wasn't something that she desired to do. And um, she comes and visits. I, I always <laughs> say she visits us in the funeral home, but it's not something that... Is her everyday line of work. Okay. All right. Now, how about your children? Um, my oldest son, he is one. He's actually away in college. He attends UNC Wilmington, um, majoring in criminal justice. So, of course, that's not funeral profession. That's not anything dealing with funeral. He comes by the funeral home. I can get him to put on a suit every once in a while. <laughs> Maybe he'll do it in the future. My baby boy, he's 12 years old. He kind of spends more time around the funeral home than my oldest son, my 22-year-old. And that's just because, of course, he loves to hang out with Dad right now. Eventually, he'll probably fade away, get into his own thought process, and then maybe come back later in life. All right. Have anything ever shaken you up? I mean, we when we talk about funeral homes, um, it, for some people, that's like there's a, a sort of creepiness about it. <laughs> But is, is there anything that ever shake, shake shaking you up uh, in your in in your time of, of doing this type of work? Um, I, I I probably say the one thing that has shook me up. So it's it's funny. My mentor, his funeral home had an old furnace in it. So uh-huh. when I first started working in the profession, I one night was in the funeral home and. He had stepped out the room, so I'm still building up to this fact that I'm working in the funeral profession. <laughs> and the furnace came on in the middle of the wintertime, scared 
the, I'm telling you, when I said it scared me, <laughs> I just jumped and got ready to take off running. And as I turned the corner, he's standing at the door laughing at me. He uh-huh. said, boy, what you crazy do? Take off running? I said, man, you got that thing going on. <laughs> on. So that's probably the one time that I was scared in the funeral home. Okay. Now I'll tell you what, with social media the way it is now, you see just about everything. Um, I've seen some unusual things. I don't know about you. Well, I'm sure you may have, but and uh, evangelists, I don't know if you have, but I have seen, uh, I think the most unusual thing I've seen um, dealing with a funeral home is a person outside of the coffin being viewed like in a corner in a jumpsuit <laughs> and a can of beer in the hand, cigarette out the mouth or in the other hand. I can't remember exactly. Um, just an unusual sight to see, unexpected. Um, have you had any unusual requests uh, at funerals that you've done? Um, have I had any unusual requests? I wouldn't necessarily say yes, I have. Mm-hmm. Um, sometime, you know, here in the South, some families still have the tradition where they like to take the body um, in the hearse of course and mm-hmm. in the casket and ride by the home place one final time so mm-hmm. those are kind of some of the requests i've had um of course some families will ask for the um nice um partake of having the casket taken out and put inside of a horse and carriage mm-hmm. but as far as the um putting a person in the corner sitting in a car <laughs> or in some on some drums or things of that nature no, I haven't had to deal with that. I tell anybody I respect um, what a person's final requests are because everyone has their own choice of final requests, and every funeral home um, has their way of doing business. And I respect what my colleagues do to make it personal for that family. So I never knock anybody for those requests, but I haven't had the opportunity of serving a family in that magnitude. Okay. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Chat City with P. Ross. I am your host, P. Ross. And in the building with me today, I have Mr. Maurice Cloud, a licensed funeral home director, and evangelist Tamika Douglas, who is a social worker. We are discussing death and how to be prepared for it. Um, I thought this was a subject that needed to be spoken of, and uh, I have these two here to assist me with that today. Mr. McLeod, um, you're, you've been instrumental in assisting families. Um, I have been in the area of funerals. We were kind of talking about that earlier before the show. Um, and the area I've assisted others in mainly was helping a family with an obituary. Um, I do graphic design a little bit and, um, um, You know, some people have reached out to me for that type of service. So I've helped others with it. But uh, I was in Charlotte, North Carolina, and um, I had a friend reach out to me that knew that I did this type of work. And he was like, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to whip up an obituary. I said, "Okay." Um, Usually the people that I help are people that I know. But this was a situation where I I did not know this family. I was asked to come to the funeral home or to go to the funeral home. And I thought I was just going to meet him and the directors, but I was placed in a room (laughs) and I I didn't know I was going to meet the family and have to talk to them head on. So, uh, that was, uh, (laughs) that was an experience for me, I would say. Um, but since then I've had the, I was asked to help with, uh, financials when it comes to a funeral. Um, that's one of the areas where I find that we are not ready. And, um, I believe most families are not when we look at the situation, um, emotionally and financially, let's touch on the financial part of it. Um, like I said earlier, we were, I was asked to help financially and we did some fundraisers uh for a few families on uh social media and i mean they went well the few that i've i've helped with um tell us is there some other way 
that we should go about being prepared uh, financially? Um, yes, I, 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 I'm glad you touched that area. And the reason why I say that is because we as a society have failed tremendously in the area of preparation. Um, the reason why I use the word preparation is because we have never accepted the fact that we are all going to leave here someday. Mm -hmm. And I say that because you have some that say, well, I've accepted the fact, but not everyone has accepted the fact. Once you start to accept the fact that we're all going to leave here, then we need to put the same effort that we put into tennis shoes and um, restaurant eating out and clothes and pocketbooks and you name it. I'm talking about boats that we're buying and all this stuff. We need to put that same effort into getting an insurance policy, some type of insurance policy that sets our families up after the fact. When we start setting our families up, you, we have to remember that passing away doesn't only um, affect those that are connected with us, but it affects the life of those that are connected with us. And we have to make sure that we take out some type of insurance policy, see some type of insurance agent that can get us set up. Um, the good thing about having our great social worker is because she has the task and the job of sometime lining up families to to talk with a, a an insurance agent and set them up when they have situations that they need to have insurance policies. Also, we need what's called pre-need. Not everybody can qualify for an insurance policy. And when we start looking at the fact that not everybody can qualify for an insurance policy, then that means health conditions may have become an effect, a factor. Something may have stopped age-wise or something to where we say, well, hey, I can't qualify for an insurance policy but you can go see a licensed funeral director that is a pre-need licensed insurance agent. You also have insurance agents that are pre-need licensed insurance um, agents that can sit down with you, set up a, um, a plan of attack for everything that you need, when it's your time to go on, then make sure that you're paying monies towards that. That means you can set it up in a trust fund account or an insurance funded account. With the trust fund account, that means that you set a certain amount that you know you can afford to put down as a down payment. That money goes in the bank. Also, that money that goes into a trust fund account has an account number. Put it irrevocable to where nobody can change it, nobody can touch it. When it becomes time for it to be used, that money is there. So let's just give you a scenario. Let's say you have Johnny. Johnny sets up a pre-need account for a funeral. Um, trust funded and he says I want to have it set up about $7,500 I put everything in I put and start paying my payments that I know I can afford and within three to four years Johnny has it all paid off so mm -hmm. now Johnny's family doesn't have to worry about the stress of taking care of Johnny when it comes to his pre-need trust funded if it's insurance funded then they'll go through an insurance agent get everything taken care of through that insurance company and set up a monthly draft that comes out for a certain dollar amount that covers that. The good part about it is the paperwork stays a copy at the funeral home, a copy goes to the North Carolina Board of Funeral Service, and a copy goes to the family, plus whatever um, general price list that was used at the time that that pre-need was set up, a copy of that goes in those files as well. So nobody can go back and change numbers and try to manipulate that family and try to get over on that family. Okay, that was one of my questions for later on, but you, you touched on it. Because um, I've always wondered, how is it that a person can pay what we, I don't know how they would do it, but they would pay, let's say, ten grand or $10,000 for a funeral, and they pass away. And then the funeral home approaches the family and say, well, you need more money for this burial because um, maybe the coffin is more now than what it was when they purchased this policy 10 years ago or something. Help us with that one. Well, a lot of that is set up on, I always say, the respect of that funeral director with their community. Now, there are some things that the funeral director cannot control, and that's what we call third-party entities, okay. um, i.e., 
your opening closing of your grave mm -hmm. because where a third party might have opened it up um, in 2022 for $750 and 2035 they may now charge 850 mm -hmm. so that may not be covered in there so those are things that if you put those notes in those documents the family knows i.e. The third party entities are not covered. So we know that we're going to have to come out of our pockets a little bit, but not as much, mm -hmm. i.e. your flowers. A florist may charge for a casket spray, full beautiful casket spray, 250 to 350. It may be now 500, but at least you know you're not coming out a whole 500. You're only coming out 125 or so on and so forth. So there, and as well as your, um, I remember you spoke about doing obituaries. Mm -hmm. Those are things that we can't control because now whoever's designing that obituary may have designed it for a dollar and 25 today. They may decide later on they're charging $2. As the economy changes, the price of things change. And we have to take that into a factor as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you mentioned earlier, um, somebody may not be able to for, afford a insurance policy or they uh, may have uh, a pre-existing condition that doesn't allow them insurance. What do we need to do in that situation? You may have said it, but I may have missed it. I'm sorry. Well, that's where, okay. that's why I was saying to uh -huh. look at a pre-need pre -need. Okay. policy. That pre-need fulfills that. Yes, ma'am. Because that still gives you some type of funeral coverage that can take care of that loved one. But the main thing is you have something that takes the stress off of your family. Uh -huh. And, and, and also let's say that you may have $10,000 that you're trying to get to, and you only got to half of that. You only got to 5,000. Well, that's $5,000. There's less stress on the family. And it's, I always say it's, it's easier to come up with 5,000 versus 10,000. Mm -hmm. I don't care what math class you took. <laughs> that's still, <laughs> the way that you have to look at it okay um why do it seem okay i don't know maybe this is just my observation here um it seems that caucasian families tend to bury their loved ones within two days whereas african-american families take five days sometimes maybe longer to bury their loved ones. Is that just me noticing that or is that a reality there? Um, sometimes I say it's personal choice. Okay. Because I've had um, Caucasian colleagues that have lost loved ones and they'll go just as many days as we as African Americans do. So I, I think that's sometimes what I call a myth or a stereotypical um, thing that people like to throw out. Okay. Like people have this myth that um, they turn dark or they mm -hmm. turn dark as faster than we do. At the end of the day, no, all of us are going to turn back to the dust of the earth. That's what my good book says that I read. So um, I stand by that good book and I believe in that good book called the Bible. So I wouldn't necessarily say that um, it's, it, it's any truth to that until I have some type of proof that I've seen. Okay, yeah, I've heard that too. That um, Caucasians turn or and light, lighter skinned people turn darker faster. I've heard that. Um, wills, do we need them and why? Um, yes, yes, everyone needs some type of will. Um, everyone needs some type of documentation to take care of their families afterwards. Let's just say you have a blended family. Mm -hmm. Um, I have myself and i'm just going to use miss tamika just for a second um we met she has a daughter i have my two boys we got married uh -huh. and now we have a blended family well mr mcleod passes away miss tamika my wife now she covers everything and my boys decide they want to show out because it was daddy's stuff uh -huh. but if we have a will set in place that kind of alleviates the arguments and alleviates all this turmoil that families can have because now they'll see it for their own self and documentation that supports having a will. Um, you, everybody needs to have that set up. Some type of will, some type of documents, um, everything from even um, health um, 
power of attorneys and, and things of nature. So we all need to do what it needs to take to be um, up on those things. Okay. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Chat City with P. Ross. I am your host, P. Ross. We are discussing death and how to be prepared for it in the building with me today. I have licensed funeral home director, uh, Mr. Maurice McLeod, and social worker, evangelist Tamika Douglas. We are taking calls for this show. If you have questions um, after watching this or during the show, please call us at, not after watching this, but during watching this show, please call us at 919-899-9305. These two are willing to ask your, ask, answer your questions. Uh, single people, social worker Tamika Douglas, tell us um, a little about um, your experience in your line of work having to deal with death and, and not only just single people, but uh, families that uh, don't have anyone at the time of death. Sure. Um, My role as a social worker is in the adult services population, wherein we serve uh, individuals who have been adjudicated incompetent by the clerk of court. Therefore, we are the primary decision maker as it relates to their life in general, uh, end of life, and um, things of that nature. Uh So we do interface with death quite a bit and making decisions for individuals who uh, may be at the end of life or who die. And um, in that, I've had to speak with doctors as if I were a natural family member for these individuals as it relates to uh, whether or not they're placed on a ventilator. Uh, We know that there are a couple of different code statuses, so we make the determination whether the individual is a full code, uh, if they will be fed, uh, or if you will withhold uh, any of those natural supports that an individual would need uh, to sustain their life. So we tend to, we have to make those types of decisions. Once they expire, we make that final decision as to what takes place with the individual. And uh, Mr. McLeod talks a great deal about the pre-needs and insurance and all of that. And what we do as social workers in this department that I'm in, because we have individuals who are going to one day die, we try to have things in place for when that happens. Now, not all of the individuals that we serve have uh, the money uh, to the money available for pre-need or trust or for us to establish insurance so unfortunately those are individuals who if a family member doesn't step up they are considered an unclaimed body so at wake county has a particular vendor that we work with uh, for individuals that are unclaimed bodies wherein the estate would pay for them there remains to be taken care of. For the individuals that we have that may have been, you know, retired or they uh, have gotten the stimulus checks that we know a lot of people got over the past couple of years and they have that money that is set aside uh, where we are able to utilize those funds and go out and establish pre-needs and things of that nature. We have been able to do that. One of the things that I've tried to do over the, over my tenure as a social worker in the adult services population is to establish pre-needs for individuals if they have any money at all left over that we can put aside for that. I try to go ahead, and even if it's a small pre-need and we pay on it over the years, I go ahead and put those in place to avoid these individuals being what we consider unclaimed bodies. Mm -hmm. Do we have a lot of unclaimed bodies out? There there are a great deal of them. Wow. Mm -hmm. What kind of number, if you can, tell us? off the top, I've been in in this particular population of social work for about 12 years uh-huh. um, in adult services. And just on my uh, caseload alone, I've probably had maybe about 20 wow. over the years. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So, um, Mr. McLeod, at what age do we need to start putting these... Um, things in place, insurance policies and trust and all those type of things? Right away. Right away from birth. Um, And I say that because um, a lot of times we keep putting off, um, like they say, don't never put off to tomorrow what you can handle today. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the biggest things that we do is we always continue to put it aside. I'll get it tomorrow. I'll get it tomorrow. Well, one day tomorrow is going to come. Mm-hmm. And one day when tomorrow does come, if we're not prepared, then reality is going to hit us in the face. Whether we want it to or not, it's going to hit us. 
Um, and that's why I always say right now is the time. You know, you got different insurance companies, not only um, the, the, the trust fund pre-needs and not only the insurance companies that we deal with on a regular like Lincoln um, Heritage and um, um, on Omaha Life Insurance, New York Life, different companies like that. Mm -hmm. But you have other insurance companies like your state farms um, that have plans that are set up um, where families can pay off a entire insurance policy within 10, sometimes 20 years. So if a family takes their young person and pay that off and have enough of so many thousands of dollars to cover, think about how that's, that's, that takes the stress off of the family. Thinks about, think about how that helps the family um, to have that, that stress taken off of them. That's the best part of it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So now, at birth, like you said, is, is the best time to start um, grief counseling. Um, as you mentioned before, uh, families have to deal with death after you're gone, after you're buried. And, um, you know, it, even though we know we've got to go, we've got to leave this world, um, we grieve. What does your funeral home offer as far as grief counseling? Um, as far as grief counseling, we have different um, counselors within the city mm -hmm. that we've connected with. Um, I most importantly connect with our social workers um, in the different areas because I, I say this with the utmost respect. Our social workers have an important task. They have an important job of taking care of us mm -hmm. because they know the counselors that can help families. They know the counselors that deal with juvenile counseling. When a loved one, um, as a young child, loses their mother, loses their father, or lose their grandparent, or lose a sibling, we as a, as a society always have this thing where we push the child aside and we never ever sit down and think about okay yeah i'm going through as an adult i just lost someone but what about that young child and 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 our social workers no counselors that are specialized in that area of youth counseling to help with the grief um and, it, and it's uh, ironic you say that I'm actually back in school right now um, studying thanatology um, to become a thanatologist um, certified because I had a young lady um, was at a school one day and she had lost a loved one. Mm -hmm. And she walked up to my table at a career day and she wanted me to give her an answer that it's okay to hate someone who had just... Um, took out the, uh, murdered their loved one mm, wow. and I could not give her that answer it bothered me so bad that I went back and sat in my office and started doing research and realizing that no matter how much education I have as far as a funeral director there are some other areas that I need to expand as far as the counseling part knowing where I can connect to be able to help a family knowing who I can reach out to to help a family because that's one of the biggest things when we lose that loved one that loved one is buried or that loved one is cremated we cut ties mm -hmm. that's one of our biggest um problems is we cut ties feel like oh well they'll get over it and we have this thing that we say I know how you feel no you don't know how that person feels right, right. because the relationship that I have with my mom might be totally different in the relationship my sister has with my mom. So we have to accept the fact that everyone's relationship is different and everyone's connection and their loss is different. So it's important to get the counseling that you need. And that's why I say we have different counselors throughout my city. Um, and sometimes I'll actually recommend them to people that are not in my city because mm -hmm. then they'll freely open up and tell how they feel to get what it is that they need. I like that, that you also recommend outside of your city, because especially if you're a part of a small town, mm -hmm. you feel like everybody knows your business and you don't want anybody to know any more, you know, and who can I really talk to trust and they won't let it go anywhere else. I, I, I appreciate that, sir. Uh, Evangelist Douglas, um, tell us about that side of your work. Does one just walk into 
the local social services department and say, hey, I need grief counseling, or how does that work? Typically, it, it doesn't happen that way. In uh -huh. most cases, we are referring people for, for that service, referring them to um, licensed clinical uh, counselors when we see the need. And that's, um, I think it's a wonderful point that um, Maurice brought up uh -huh. as it relates to counseling because it's very hard in many cases, in particular in our uh, you know, culture, when it comes to therapy and counseling in general, for so long, it's been a stigma where people think, oh, if you go to a therapist, you're crazy. If You see, you, you don't want to uh -huh. sit on a leather couch because you, you, you're <laughs> crazy. And so it's just been a stigma for so long. So it's kind of difficult. But I think we've gotten a lot better where people are now saying, right. okay, I need therapy and Jesus. So they're, they're more <laughs> willing now to go to the therapist. So to answer your question, in many cases, it's a situation where we're referring that when we see that need, referring them to individuals who they can sit with and talk to about various situations that they are faced with in life. Okay. If you've been listening and you have questions for our very licensed folks here that can help us with uh, death, if you have any questions, feel free to call now at 919-899-9305. They will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. All right. Um, let's talk about cremations a little bit, Maurice. Um, uh, some folks feel like, like it, that's something they don't want to do or it's taboo or it's sinful. Uh, tell us why it's not. Um, I always, and I'll, I'll go back to one of my responses earlier. Mm -hmm. Everyone has their own preference. Everyone has their own choice. And everyone has their own decision making when it comes to how they want and what they want to choose as their method of disposition. Mm -hmm. um, where I might say I want to be buried today in 2022. Um, 20 years from now, I may change that thought. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because not everything that you think of when you're at one age is the same thought that you have at another age. Um, cremations have become, and they're starting to become even more the norm. Mm -hmm. A lot of family members are starting to see that they want to be cremated versus buried um, in your traditional fashion. And there's no knock to those that want to still touch the traditional fashion. Um, but start to look at their other areas um, that you can go into with um, the cremation. A lot of people go with um, cremation now as a uprising. Um, we were doing some research and it's been scientifically said that in the next um, 30 years, we'll be where we're right now probably at 25 to 30 percent. We'll be at probably 45 to probably 55 percent of our society will be cremated. Mm -hmm. um, I've had personal family members that's close as aunts and uncles that said they want to be cremated. Don't bury me, cremate me. So you have to respect what it is that a person chooses as their method of dis disposition and go forward with it. Um, Evangelist, Evangelist, is there any spiritual notes you want to touch on with that? Yes, as, as aforementioned, people have their own thoughts on it and beliefs. Mm -hmm. I've, I've heard people references reference um, being against cremation because of uh, the scripture was states um, and they were buried. So they take that scripture and they uh, believe that that is referencing the fact that one should be buried versus cremation. Um, as mentioned, people have their own feelings and thoughts about it. In many cases, um, people kind of look at cremation and say, oh, they're cremated because they didn't have insurance or they didn't have the money to do it. You have people that have a million dollar insurance policy and they're still cremated. Uh, so again, I think it just ties into the beliefs of that individual, um, how they look at it as it relates to scripture and what they believe that that particular scripture means or what it's saying. And I, I just think that that's how it is based on, on feeling and sometimes history of the family. You have some families where most are cremated and mm -hmm. that's what they do. And then again, now, as, I, as, as Maurice mentioned, I think people are gearing more towards it. I'm seeing an increase in cremation as, as never before, to be honest <laughs> with you, versus years past mm -hmm. where people were like, oh, we just don't do that. We're not going to do that. So I think it's on per personal preference. Yeah. My personal belief is uh, um, 
finances. I believe a lot of times the families, um, because they are not prepared to pay for a funeral, they result into what may be less expensive, which are, I believe, cremations. Hey, can I step in? Sure. So now <laughs> your, your personal beliefs are finances, and uh -huh. I respect that, but uh -huh. it goes back to what um, Evangelist Tamika said. Uh -huh. You have multi-millionaires that have said, I want to be cremated. Uh -huh. It's not about the money. And the reason why I say that is because I've dealt with millionaires that people tell me all the time, hey, you took care of that family. What made them go cremation? Mm -hmm. That was their choice. Mm -hmm. Some people have their love for the mountains. Mm -hmm. um, some people have their love for the beach. And they want to be buried at the beach. And what I mean by buried, meaning their cremains scattered along the beach. Well, you can't take a big casket, bring it all down to the beach and go <laughs> digging in the sand and bury it and then expect our family to come back and lay on the beach next week knowing that Johnny or Martha was just buried there last week. Mm -hmm. So we have to respect the fact that they have other ways that they want to be um, taken care of as far as their method of disposition to connect with their love. I and believe that's one that. Way. I believe that too. I mean, I'm just, I, and maybe I should have said it differently, but I feel like sometimes in um, that, that's, that's just a choice why people, uh, or they choose to go that route because of, 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 of uh, finances, lack of finances. Um, and you do have that. And mm -hmm. that's good that you say that P Ross, because you do have some families and there's no knock to that family whatsoever. Right. right. But we right. have to do what our money can afford. Right. You know, um, we as funeral professionals, uh, it's our duty to love that family, care for that family. That's why my funeral home sticks by the superior um, service with compassionate care. Mm -hmm. And I stick and I push my people to understand that compassionate care is the most important part of it. But also, whether that family's paying us 3000 Five thousand or twenty thousand, you give that family the utmost respect, but most importantly, give them love, no matter what they're spending, because everybody deserves that. We're all in one family, one connection. So that's important. Amen. Let's talk about final burial places, um, entombments, and um, the graveyard. Um, touch on that a little bit for us, Maurice, if you will. Um, final burial places. You have different um, family members that may go into a mausoleum, um, and you have very fa uh, various family members that may go into um, different cemeteries. You have church cemeteries. You have um, your perpetual care type cemeteries, and the difference is that perpetual care cemetery is um, owned either by a personal party or a group of people who say well okay these are the um, stipulations for going in there our cemetery no um, monuments above a certain height they must be flat um, type sim um, monuments no live flowers um, different things that go into that type of care of that cemetery um, where you have your your, your my, uh, mausoleums where that person is put into the different types of crepes and different nicks that go into the wall of that cemetery uh, mausoleum that keeps them in um, those types of um, care. And then you have like your church cemeteries um, that were connected to a church and that's where we're going to be buried at. And then you have your personal family cemeteries. Um, some families have their own cemetery and nobody can be buried in that cemetery except for somebody that either have the bloodline of a Jones mm -hmm. or have the marriage of a Jones. So that's, that's um, the different types um, that we have. And then some people are, as we say, buried at sea. Mm -hmm. You'll see someone on, um, take a, a, a casket, put it on the back of a boat, drive it out into the ocean, go so far out, and it goes overboard. And they'll bury that loved one at sea because that was the choice as the method of disposition for that loved one. Yes. Okay. Um, now, if I'm correct, usually the um, cemetery expense is different from the funeral expenses, or they're not. Usually, they're not included, right? So, when you're at the time, when you're trying to make arrangements for yourself or your loved ones, you should also consider that as a fact. 
Yes, ma'am. Okay. You definitely, you definitely should consider that as a fact. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of times um, family members will say, uh, and I get it all the time, mom paid in this much money um, for their burial expense. Mm -hmm. And I know when mom paid it, she had all her stuff put in there. Well, guess what? Like I tell you about that third party, mom may have paid for that plot mm -hmm. at Johnson Cemetery, but that opening close may not have been taken up at that time because that is a third party in the price range change. So those are things that we have to consider. And I tell families all the time, I don't like to tackle that portion because like you had said before, some families aren't prepared. And the worst thing we can do as a funeral director is take on an expense that we know is going to hurt our business. Meaning, i.e., we may do some type of payment arrangement with a family to allow them so much down and allow them to pay monthly payments. Well, that perpetual care cemetery that that family really wants to go in may not take a payment plan. Mm -hmm. So then now you're asking that funeral director to write a check or that family has to have someone write a check right away because those are just the ways that the cemetery are set up. Um, if it may be a church cemetery, to make the church cemetery may decide that, hey, you have to come up with this 1200 before that loved one can be buried. So those are things that we cannot control. And mm -hmm. those cemeteries are separate from the funeral home itself. Miss Douglas, how is it that the state can come in and uh, remove graves uh, from a grave site? Like, say, they need that area to build a new highway. I'm not aware of that. I yeah. I mean, I've, I've heard of things like that happening, but I'm not aware of what uh, that authority looks like from okay. the state. All right. Would you happen to know, Mr. McLeod? Um, there are certain things that we cannot control. Um, and what I mean by that is just mm -hmm. because a person says that they want to move certain bodies to another area for a highway to be built, that family has to give... Um, their agreement for that to happen so it doesn't happen right away is it may take two three sometimes four or five years because mm -hmm. let's say you have a johnson family that might have been buried there that um representative who's over that project has to go out and find everybody that's connected to that johnson family for those two or three bodies and be in agreement for those bodies to be moved mm -hmm. and then they have to put that loved one in something either equal to the quality of what they were in or they have to be put in something better than the quality of what they were in, um, i.e. casket as well as also some type of out of burial container. So we cannot just take that loved one and just say, hey, we're going to move them tomorrow and put them there. Mm -hmm. There's still stipulations that the health department in that county has to follow as well as they have to have a licensed funeral director and sometimes they have to call the vault company back out to come and move those vaults if that person was buried in a vault. So there's still um, stipulations that need to be followed when it comes to that. That's good information to know. Um, Mr. McLeod, on your website, uh, you uh, touched on that uh, you need, not that you need, that you you have a focus on veterans, and you mentioned earlier on that you were a veteran. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, can you give us a little bit more detail on the focus, the specific focus that you have for veterans um, at your place? I have a big focus on veterans because, one, I tell anybody, somebody that takes time and takes a um, bravery to serve this nation, it's only right that we give them the thanks that they deserve. Um, that means that as long as we make sure we keep up with the necessary paperwork, their DD-214s, veterans can be buried in some type of state or national cemetery um, free of charge. Also, those um, certain state cemeteries, i.e. Your, your state cemetery down at Fort Bragg, um, in the Fort Bragg Sand Hills Veterans Cemetery, they have um, vaults that are already purchased and they are already underground for that veteran to be buried in free of charge. And if that um, person has a spouse, 
that spouse can be buried in that veteran cemetery as well free of charge national cemeteries same thing and then we also have in those veteran cemeteries we have um the um, areas where cremations can be buried in those veteran cemeteries as well and i take it very serious because i feel that we should honor those that have made the sacrifice to serve this nation and not just push them aside um, make sure that they have a proper burial make sure that we give them the um, national flag that they served and cover them in, in, in that capacity. So that's why I take it very serious when it comes to our veterans. I don't care what branch of service. They were all my brothers and sisters right. before, and they're still my brothers and sisters now. All right. And I agree with you on that. And I want to say thank you um, for making them an emphasis in your program there. All right. We are Coming to the close of our show, um, as I said, I wanted to, I, I chose death as a topic today, as a discussion, because I felt like it was needed. Um, and I didn't want to just, uh, I wanted to touch on the, uh, the, the need of being prepared, first of all, and for, foremost. Um, didn't expect the evangelist to join us today, but I can't let this show go off air without her just touching on the spiritual side of death. So we're going to take these last few minutes to let her do that. Um, and I would like for Maurice to um, cover anything that we may have missed after she finishes and, um, you know, cover, uh, touch on anything that we may have missed or any questions I may have missed that you feel that the audience should know. Absolutely, and thank you for even having me back again today for this very, very relevant topic. I would also say just before we close out that um, even as we talk about the, the importance of the preparation for death, it's so necessary to have the conversation about this stuff with family while we are still here. That's another very instrumental uh, part of the dying process. It's something that we don't typically like to do. We don't like to talk about final wishes. And um, so you're going through the grief process and and then you have to worry, okay, would mama want it this way? Or is this what she desired? And then you have families that sometimes argue about things that could have been resolved early on. One of the things that we say within my profession is that conversation without documentation is lost history. So mm -hmm. um, as um, Marie so eloquently talked about the wills and the importance of that kind of stuff, I just would say have those conversations. They're not always easy to have, but we've got to get better about having those tough conversations about death and um, just last wills and even before you die what what your wishes are should you begin to transition you're in the hospital they need to put you on the ventilator do you want to go on the ventilator or do you want to die naturally so those conversations are so imperative and as I uh, mentioned just that spiritual aspect of course I'm a believer I'm a Christian and I believe that um, in order for us to see Jesus Christ and to see him in peace that we need to be born again believers we need to have made it right with with our Lord and Savior and with people so I would certainly um, encourage people to get their house in order um, not if, if, even if you don't have a, a terminal illness or you don't think you're gonna die anytime soon I believe that to prepare um, spiritually is so necessary in, in having accepted at Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and make sure Amen. make sure that we are right with him and also with others. Thank you. Uh-huh. All right. And Maurice. Um Evangelist said it said it best. <laughs> um I am too a believer and I believe in standing on the promises of God. Um like he said, we're we're made in his likeness and we're made in his image. And someday we shall return to the dust from, which, from the earth from whence we came. And I believe that we need to always make sure that we're building upon and building towards getting to see his face um, someday when it is our time. And in the process of doing so, we must make sure that we do the proper things that set us up spiritually, but also set us up on the natural side of things. That means making sure that we have things in order on our document side of things. So I, I enjoyed that statement that you made. That, that, I'm about to use that. That was real <laughs> good. <laughs> real free. Okay, and um, if you uh, need to deal with grief after the death of a loved one uh, here in Wake County, 
Evangelist Douglas, Tamika Douglas, could you give us some information on how one can um, get that information or get that counseling? Absolutely. There are, there are so, so many websites that would um, list various um, clinical uh, counselors from a variety of, of walks and, and paths. You have some people who are more interested in the Christian counselor, and then you have that person that is more uh, gearing towards therapeutics. So um, psychology, uh, any kind of way, even Googling, simply Googling your area where you are um, searching therapist in Southern Pines therapists within the Raleigh area and those particular websites will take you to the areas where you can even look up you know their educational background their licensure uh, you, you know the the populations that they serve so sometimes just simply going to Google and putting it information in there just something as simple as that and word of mouth is always good um, when you talk to other people about therapists that they've had I have people that ask me all the time about therapists within the Durham area or the uh, you know just different areas in and I'm able to kind of tell them, you know, who whose practice I, I've used before, I recommend it, and who's done well with the people. Um, when it comes to grief, that is certainly something that we must make sure that we deal with. Um, a lot of people can, tend to carry it, and they, they work through it, and that keeps you busy, but you never deal with that grief that true grief and then we end up with people who have breakdowns and and mm -hmm. then it hits them they they didn't cry you know you, you see a person and they go through a, a tough loss and you don't see them cry i mean that that's not a normal thing you got to deal with it so mm -hmm. counseling is so essential so sometimes just simply googling um you know licensed therapists or grief counselors and again it's going to take you to different um sites where you'll be able to access that information and so. Okay, thank you. And, and very quickly, Mr. McLeod, if you can tell us how to contact you for you can, more information. You can contact me. Um, I am, again, the owner and operator of McLeod Funeral Home, located 310 Cortland Drive in the city of Sanford, North Carolina, 919-292-6565. Um, we are in the process of expanding McLeod Funeral Home, so I always tell people, look for us in the future. We'll be probably expanding to a city near you. All right. That concludes our show. Thank you for listening to Chat City with P. Ross. Join us again next Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Oak 93.5. Blooming from Linwood, this is WRLYLP Raleigh. Oak 93.5.